Okay, so the last section of uh, this unit and of the course right, has to do with the role and notion of power right? and uh, the idea of hermeneutic injustice right? and, and, you know, moral epistemology. So uh, this is a very, very, very broad overview. It just touches on the issue. We're not going to go into it in any real depth other than to acknowledge its existence. If you're interested in the subject, there's a wonderful book called Epistemic Injustice, or sorry, Epistemic Injustice by the philosopher Miranda Fricker. Um, now, uh, what she argues in the broadest of terms, um, and this is the broadest strokes of her argument, um, like the very rough character sketch outlines of a highly detailed picture. She says that moral and more to the, uh, so our social relations are relations of power, right? There's always a power imbalance, and uh, and it's not necessarily that the imbalance is necessarily bad, uh, but there is a power uh, a power imbalance. There's always someone who's kind of more powerful, some one or group that's more powerful than another group. That's how social relations work. Hierarchies. Right? The only case in which that's not true is amongst friends. Right? Ostensibly, friends are the only really true equals. Um, right? You can argue that grown family uh, that a family unit doesn't have to have a hierarchy, but there's still a hierarchy of authority and therefore power imbalance, especially with kids. Like adults need to have authority over children because children do not have, uh, are not developmentally at a point cognitively to have full and respon uh, full responsible authority over themselves. Right. And more to the point, this means that since uh, our moral relations are by necessity, social relations, uh, at least when we're talking about morality between people, uh, then this means that moral relations also have this power balance. Just think again of um, the relationship between rights and obligations that we discussed in week 13. Right? Every person with a right holds a double power over a person with an obligation, and the person with the obligation is bound to respect the person with the rights, demands, and claims. Right. Um, uh, so there is a power op uh, uh, power operating, but power does not just need to operate actively; it can operate passively. And where it can operate passively, it can be purely structural. So this is what we see with things like group power, governmental structure, so on and so forth. Uh, we can see hermeneutical or more to the point epistemic injustice um, for whole groups because the groups that have power are given sort of more recognition or authority in matter in, in the ability to make certain claims and make moral demands. They can create knowledge. They become the arbiters of what is knowledge, what is right, and what is wrong, right? Um, which can lead to a devaluing of, uh, you know, other groups' own demands, their own needs, and their own voice as a source of knowledge for what they need, right? Uh, an example of this would be the way that uh, medicine has been done for years and years and years. Right um, now, we're kind of swinging to the opposite extreme in many regards, especially with like a uh, uh, psychiatry, uh, where the patient is the one who knows themselves better than anyone outside. That's a bit of a fiction too, um, but for many, many years, it was like doctors know best, right? Uh, psychiatric treatment in the uh, late 50s and 
through the 60s and early 70s up to the time of exposés like uh, exposé pieces like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest was just doctors know better, patients don't need to be listened to or consulted, right? Um, and if the patient is a problem, lobotomizing it, uh, uh, lobotomizing them does away with it. That was a standard uh, way of thinking about it, right? Dismiss the patients because they're not the ones in power. Especially since, you know, a lot of people, a lot of patients were involuntary, uh, you know, uh, involuntarily committed. Even those who voluntarily committed themselves were treated with the same degree of, you know, uh, uh, contempt for their own thoughts on their condition as those who were involuntarily committed. Right. So what this reveals is that like prejudices uh, that are in the background can come to the foreground and operate into the particular situations and feed back in, create basically a feedback loop along the power structure, right? uh, both in our daily interactions and across a wider system. And this can affect the degree to which we give weight to what other people say, to how credible we take their testimony to be. Uh, think about one of the biggest issues being a couple of years ago um, at the time of this recording. I think it was like 2017, maybe 2018. There was the House Committee met to determine, the White House Committee met to determine uh, the status of like the legality of abortion under uh, one of the new laws. Right, uh, an attempt to overturn Roe v. Wade, I think it was, and um, there was not one female representative there to talk about female, you know, a, a women's reproductive health. Not one. It was a room full of old white men dictating, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, healthcare. Uh, choices for women. So their voice was completely stifled. Uh, and because it wasn't viewed as a credible source of information or testimony in its own right. And so this is one of the other problems, right? Is when you talk about relationships and morality between people, you're always talking about some, to some degree, power structures. Uh, since you're talking about social relations, when you talk about moral relations. In moral uh, social uh, relations, as well as um, most of our moral relations, do have power structures to them. One of the consequences is we have to be careful of uh, not devaluing, or for that matter, overvaluing the testimony of any one group, right? And uh, as a source of knowledge, um, or devaluing. Are overvaluing their agency, right? and especially we can't just disregard them as basically human. But there's always that risk that the prejudices of one group in a power, uh, you know, uh, in the power structure towards another group are so fundamentally intertwined with how we, how they view another, uh, you know, that other group that. They don't consider them human, right? They deny their basic humanity to a certain degree. And that's problematic and needs to be watched out for just as much as the less insidious, uh, more malicious, um, passive elements of hermeneutic injustice.